Startup Talks at uh, HPI. Um, uh, welcome to uh, another part in our series. Today we are very warmly rec uh, welcoming uh, Patrick Brienen uh, to, to uh, HPI uh, with his company Orderbird. Um, and uh, he will say a lot about Orderbird and he will t tell us a lot about himself also today. And we're really happy to have him here. Not only because Orderbird is such an interesting and cool company, but also because it has, been has a co-founder that is from HPI. Um, Steven Reinicke was his name, um, and, and Reinisch, and, and not only reason to Steven, but also because you were actually the winner of the first uh, business plan contest here at HPI, and that was back in 2011. 11. So that's quite, a, quite some time that has uh, passed ever since, and you've been very successful in what you've been doing. Uh, I think you have about 140 employees nowadays, I don't know if I'm correct. Almost. Almost, uh, aiming for more than 140, I guess. Um, so uh, very good that you're here, very good that you will be answering all questions and, and taking us along the way. So I would be, I would be, I personally would be interested to learn like one or two or three for things. One thing would be um, you're the chief revenue officer. Uh, and for everyone who doesn't know what a chief revenue officer does, I would be interested to find out what a chief revenue officer does actually. I'll explain. That's very good. Then um, there has been a lot of uh, talk and a lot of going on in the media about iZettl. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to try to understand and learn what is your, is that a competitor? Is that a role model? Is that, how do you, yeah, how do you put yourself in, in comparison to iZettl? Um, yeah, and I think this is these are gives you some some touching points to sure. to go along the way. Maybe another thing um, that has sprung to mind is um, the there's always when you're when you're a a, a new company, a startup company, um, there's always a, a, a difference, or most of the times, a difference between revenue and profit. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, how, how that, you know. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, a slight, there's, there's a slight difference. There's, there's quite a difference. Uh, and it, it would be interesting to learn because sometimes people expect a lot of profit that comes from revenue right at the beginning. And that's not always uh, something to expect. Yes. Um, so those are the things I would be interested in. And uh, again, thank you for being here and uh, for sharing all this with us. Thanks for having me. So thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, thanks to Mrs. Villo for the organization. Um, I'll do this in English, and I have to warn you guys, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really fit, so I'm going to lose my voice about 20 minutes into this talk. <clears throat> Hopefully, I'm going to last 20 minutes. Um, as already mentioned, we do have a personal connection to, to HPI. We won this award. Uh, we've been uh, mentored by HPI, namely by Ruven Westphal, who I'd like to thank um, for his, his support, especially in the beginning of, of our company. He really, really helped us to make and drive strategic decisions. And uh, today I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about our company and I'm going to talk more about uh, how I believe you can drive innovative ideas and business models into the mass market. And I'll, I'm going to touch on the theory of doing so. Um, which was not invented by me. And uh, then I'm going to give you examples and a couple of insights how we did at Audibird. So who's this guy? My name's Patrick. Um, I'm the chief revenue officer of the Audibird AG. What is chief revenue? I'm the guy that has to bring in all the money, means marketing and sales. So for all of you studying computer science, please do me one favor. Don't ask specific questions. I can't answer them. Uh, uh, so I drive marketing and sales. Um, we scaled a business-to-business -business software business from zero to more than 10 million euro revenue uh, in about seven years. And I'm going to share um, examples where things went well and where things did not went, go so well for us. My personal background is um, uh, studies of international business in Austria and Australia. In Australia, I found, founded my first company. Um, when I came back to Europe, um, I worked in a marketing agency where I get to meet my co-founder, Jacob, who I today run Audibird for the last seven and a half years. 
Um, so my, my background was always marketing and sales. And um, as already mentioned, today our company has about 120 employees, about 10 million euro in revenue. And what we're doing is for those who keep wondering who's the guy, a uh, point of sale system for restaurants. So most of you probably don't know what a point of sale system is. I didn't know either. Um, it's the machine, the box, where you type in burger, fries, beer, and then it spits out a bill and the cashier pops up and in the kitchen there's a printer that produces tickets for the kitchen. And to compare to iZettle, um, nowadays we're somewhat similar. But when our both companies started, at the same time, iZettel um, was very much oriented uh, at the company called SquareUp in the United States, founded by Jack Dorsey, founder of, Qu of Twitter, and what they focus on is payment. So you all know these payment terminals that you normally use, and they disrupted that with a uh, basically a different read and a different kind of service. And from that, accepting payments, Square and, Bo and also iZettle, they, they integrate deeper into the industries and they started developing a point-of-sale system. So they came from accepting payments and went into being a point-of-sale software company and we did it the other way around. We, from the beginning of our company, we were um, determined and um, we were sure that the point of sale system, the software organizing the small business is the core of these small businesses. And then we integrate it into payments. So first we started with a uh, software for the point of sale and then we integrated payments. So nowadays we're doing pretty much exactly the same, but they came from payments and we came from point of sale. Now I'd like to know about you guys so I can tailor my, my presentation a little bit towards you. Who's studying here? Everyone, great. Who wants to or is thinking about starting their own business? That's great, wow, impressive, nice. So um, lucky enough I'm allowed to, to, to give similar presentations uh, here and there and sometimes uh, I give these presentations to people that are looking to disrupt an industry or uh, challenging uh, the market leaders and sometimes I give the same presentation for existing market leaders that are really, really afraid of you and they should be. <laughs> All right, um, I'm, doc I'm going to talk about what I call the bridge of death. Normally you'd call it the chasm, uh, uh, a word that describes something like the Grand Canyon, right? Something you have to cross to get over it, but nobody knows the word chasm, so I changed it to bridge of death, and it's it, it's it sounds it sounds a little bit uh, more um, dramatic. All right. Um, so disruptive models often struggle to reach the mass market that is highly protected by the market leaders. The main reason is that the early market works completely different than the mass market. And many, many startups are quite successful in the early adopter, early market. But nine out of 10 ideas, business models, startups, they fail to cross that bridge to the mass market because they don't know or they ignore that these two markets are completely different. And if you don't adapt, you will fail. I say that, but there's Many smart people before me that said that, and one guy in particular, he's, he's called Geoffrey Moore. He wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm, and everything, or most of that you hear today from a theoretical point of view was invented by him. So if you like this presentation, send an email to Geoffrey Moore and tell him he's a great guy. If you didn't like or didn't understand it, write me an email, I failed to explain what this very, very smart person invented years and years ago in the late 90s. So um, today I'm going to talk about how to cross that bridge first in theory and then in practice. I'll, I'm going to talk about how we crossed that chasm, how we crossed that bridge. And um, so the first step is to understand how a market works. And I'd like to show you a video to start with.
You saw that girl watching them? Doesn't care. Sits down. That's what we call early adopters. She sits down, she doesn't care. And there we go. We have a tipping point. All right, <clears throat> so what I just showed you is a good example on how a market reacts to innovation. And um, what we've seen is that when the masses moved, most likely their main driver was they didn't want to be, be left. They didn't want to miss out on something, right? So the motivation of the first couple of people joining that guy was completely different than the motivation of the I know, 100, 200 of those that followed. And I've referenced uh, this guy before, Geoffrey Moore. He wrote this book called Crossing the Chasm, and he talks about the technology adoption life cycle, which is the answer to the question how a market reacts to innovation or a disruptive business model. And it does not only apply to technology. I believe it, it applies to any disruptive, innovative idea. And sometimes it's not even the product that is being innovated. Sometimes it's the marketing or the sales channel that you can innovate on. And science has shown over and over again that there's five groups. And to, successful, to be successful, you've got to address these groups one by one in the right order. And basically, you have to change your entire company every time you address the respective group. So the first group is a group called innovators. They are your friends. They are technology enthusiasts. They are waiting for the new innovation, the new technology. They're, they're great risk takers. They want to be involved. They're going to try prototypes. They're going to you know, pay extra to, uh, to be the first ones. Right? They have a certain value of getting something that is called new. and they want, to be the <clears throat> they want to be the first ones, right? They, they, they like that idea of being uh, pioneers. And they don't so much care about if any, someone else is trusting that solution. They're quite independent, and, and they make it up for themselves. The second group is the early adopters. You've all heard about them. Those early adopters, they don't just buy new stuff because they want to have new stuff. They are visionaries. They are willing to take a risk if it solves a problem. They are OK with compromise as long as, in their eyes, there's a return on investment. And they see the opportunity in something new rather than the risk that comes with it. Next group is um, the early majority. All right, so the early majority, they are pragmatists. They are not OK with compromise. But they will move, and they will only move if their pain or gain is 
substantial, right? They will not move if uh, not all aspects of the offering feel perfect to them, and they are afraid of change, something very German. And most important, they need trusted references, right? They don't want to be the first ones. They look around, and if nobody else is moving, they won't move, right? And <clears throat> as you can see in these surfaces, these two groups are very small, and that group is much, much bigger. And if you had, and this is a, uh, an American graphic, if you had to draw that for the Germans, these parts were even smaller, and that one would be most likely even bigger. And the biggest of all in Germany would much likely be the late majority, all right? They're a bit like the early majority, but they, they don't even move if it doesn't even require a compromise. They will wait and see until most of the market has moved, and then they will follow. They are true followers. Um, my mom got a smartphone, right, when there was no other choice, right? So you can, you can maybe relate to that. And then some people, they're laggards. They would even invest if they could, you know, they would pay a premium if they could stick with the old. So these are the Germans, and these are probably the Swiss, right? It's hyper conservative. All right. The bridge of death, the chasm that you have to cross as a startup, as a challenging company into an existing market, is addressing the early adopters and then moving from the early adopters to the early majority. And the transition between addressing the innovators and the early adopters is fairly smooth. They operate in a somewhat similar way. Um, but that transition is not smooth at all. You have to change everything about your company. You need to commit to one segment, and you most likely have to commit to lower growth, and you've you got to have absolute trust that in your segment, you can push out the market leader. So over and over in, in the history of like the last 20, 30 years of technology, we've seen that you have to move through those segments. There is no shortcut. You've got to address the innovators first, then the early, early adopters, then you have to commit to one segment within the early market, and then you have the opportunity to address the mass market. So in the beginning, you're going to throw your product or your idea, your business model into the market, and the, you know, the innovators and the early adopters, they will love it, right? Innovators, they will just jump on it. And even the early adopters, if you solve a problem, and let's, let's, get, let's, let's, let's assume that whatever you invented or you're going to invent does solve a problem, will sell it easily to the early adopters, right? They look at it, oh, solve my problem, good, I'm going to invest, I'm going to get a return, perfectly fine, works for them. They don't need much reference. But then to address the mass market, that's all almost impossible, right? If the mass market only buys what other people are buying, how would you ever enter that market, right? If they only buy what the other guy, people are buying, there will be no, no new player. And the trick is, in the beginning, while addressing innovators and early adopters, you observe very, very carefully. You will be successful if you solve a problem, but that is not enough. It is not so difficult to be successful in the first two segments. What is what is difficult is to reach the mass market, and you will do that by choosing one niche, one sub-segment of the market. So what you will do in the first phase, you will sell to these innovators and early adopters, and you will observe, you will collect data. Where is my customer acquisition cost the lowest? Where is my NPS, net promoter score? The answer to the question if they would recommend your product or service. Where is it the highest? Right? Where is the word of mouth factor, the referral factor 
the highest. Where is my customer lifetime value? The highest were the lowest. So even though you, your business is going well, you should already start segmenting your customers by age, by gender, by industry, whatever, right? And you have to learn about your customers and your prospect. You already also have to learn about those customers that you don't close, maybe even more so than those that you do close. So you understand which part of the market is happiest, most happy with your product, right? Because if you want to address the mass market, you have, at some point, you have to choose that niche, that sub-segment of the market. And then, so you choose the segment where you believe you can solve the biggest pain, where your product or service is much, much better than the one of the competition. And hopefully, you're going to find a niche with enough individuals or companies in it. And uh, then it's time to focus, to focus, focus, focus. You're going to focus on that sub-segment of the market. And then you're going to start to drive competition out in that segment. And that means starting to say no. So whereas you're going to be broad and being, you're going to catch yourself saying yes to basically any customer, now is the time to start saying no. And that is something very, very difficult, especially if you talk to investors and or salespeople like me. They will always say yes because they're trying to get their commission. So that's the challenge. You, at some point, you have to commit to one sub-segment of the market. And then this sub-segment, you're going to try to drive out your competition, right? You're going to focus marketing, brand, communication, sales, product, service. Everything will be made just perfect for that sub-segment of the market. Nobody can be perfect for the entire planet, for the entire market, right? And the more you slice down your market in size of the company, industry, uh, user behavior, uh, whatever it is, right? The smaller your subsegment is, the better you can address it, the happier can, you can make those, those customers, right? You can make them happy by addressing them, saying uh, we're the perfect uh, brand for universities, right? And then you can say, well, we're the perfect brand for German-speaking universities. Maybe we're the perfect brand for German-speaking universities in the tech world, whatever. Okay, so you can, you can always slice it down, slice it down, slice it down. And it's a balance between market size and level of perfection, right? But only, only if you are much, much better than competition, you will be successful in this sub-segment. And the, the, the goal is to, to drive those competitors out and to become market leader in one sub-segment of the market. And you won't do this alone. It's very likely you won't have the resources to drive com competition out. It's much likelier you're going to find yourself struggling with resources. So your product or service will most likely be accompanied by additional software, by um, additional hardware, by services, and you're going to do that most likely through partnerships. Right? So instead of developing everything yourself, you might you, you want to look into partnerships. Partnerships in marketing, partnerships in sales, partnerships in service, partnerships in product, right? To perfectly address this one subsegment of the market. And we when you have when you have the first subsegment and you are a market leader for this very, very tiny subsegment of the market, then and only then it's time to expand. So it's all about focus and saying no until you are market leader in this first subsegment of the market. And then you're going to attack the market right next to it, right? And as you know, segmentation is all about needs and wants. So you're going to address the, the next segment that has very, very similar needs and wants like the first segment 
that you chose. And whereas you're going to focus on product and technology in the early phase of your company, you're going to focus on competition and market when it's time to scale up, right? Because of how these two groups think completely differently. Remember, innovators and early adopters, they are interested by the technology. They are interested in, in something new. They are risk takers. But the mass market is not. So what really works well for the early market is co a complete disaster for the mass market. One example, your, your website is something like a shopping window for your company, right? So whereas it's a very good idea to promote yourself being a winner of an innovation award or, or being a startup of the year or uh, being new in the market, right? This is going to be something that is very, very helpful to address the first two segments. The mass market will hate you for it. They will leave your website and say, I'm not your guinea pig. I'm not here to try out that you can fail. Maybe you're only 10 people. Maybe you're not going to be around in a year. I'm not going to put my trust in your brand. What works for the first group does not work for the second group and vice versa. So if you're about to cross that chasm, you want to, you want to dramatically change everything in your company, the kind of people you hire in marketing and sales, the website, what we did, for example, we eliminated every new, every startup award, and we got the TÜV logo on our website. <laughs> TÜV, that's what they want. They want security. We used the, the word market leader, and that really, really worked well. So, crossing the chasm, crossing that bridge of death, um, you want to select your target market. You want to select that sub-segment of the market, and you want to do that very wisely, because most likely you only have the resources for one shot, right? Because you're going to, be, you're going to go all in, in product, service, price, marketing, sales, everything is going to be tailored to that sub-segment of the market. And that includes saying no to the other markets. The other segments of the market are a distraction. You will not be the perfect product. You will not be mass market compatible in all segments. You will not. You will fail. So if you can't make them super happy, mass market happy, don't accept them as customers. Create the whole product, the whole offering, the perfect pricing, the perfect service, the perfect product, the perfect brand, the perfect website, the perfect onboarding, everything for that sub-segment of the market. If you do, you can drive the existing competitors out. You can drive out the existing market leaders and people will talk about you. And that is the only thing that drives the mass market, it's word of mouth. They will take references within each other. They will look left and right, and that's how they make your decisions. They don't care about innovation awards. They don't care about any blogs or any uh, articles on the web. They simply don't care. They are afraid of change, all right? So you really want to kick ass in this one sub-segment of the market. Right? And you want to attack the market leaders directly. You want to compare yourself against the market leader, and you want to attack them directly with a better product, a better price, a better service, a better uh, sales strategy. And I have to break it to you. You've got to be better in everything. It does not, it is not sufficient to only have a better product. Product does not sell itself. Right? Then you focus on competition. Now, that was the first part on the theory on how to cross that bridge, how to enter the mass market. And again, this was not written by me. This was written by Geoffrey Moore. And it was Geoffrey Moore that made the comparison to the Second World War. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll make a, uh, I'll tell you a short um, story about uh, a comparable situation in World War II. So Martin Leader, Germany, took over large parts of Europe. And challenging uh, allies, they were to disrupt this, this market for very, very good reasons. 
and they prepared for two years. And they were scanning the entire borderline of France and other countries. And what did they do? They prepared for two years and they went all in with, and I'm not too sure about the numbers, but I think it was more than 200,000 soldiers in one dusty morning. And they concentrated on a handful of beaches, right? Omaha Beach and the, uh, and the beaches next to it. And they fought for more than 24 hours and they gave it everything they had. And they had one goal, securing this tiny, tiny piece of land, Omaha Beach, right? And they almost didn't make it, right? But that was their market entry strategy. They secured that market, those, this tiny, tiny sub-segment of the market. And they became market leaders in that sub-segment. That's why this segment is called the beachhead segment, right? You want to secure your beachhead segment of the market. You want to secure one tiny, tiny piece of land. And then you operate from there. Then you attack the markets next to it. But if you fail to enter the first segment, you'll fail on a broad scale because you cannot win a war against the market leaders on all fronts, right? You really have to select very, very wisely. Now, let me tell you how our company went, went through that cycle and about all the stupid mistakes that we did. Um, <clears throat> so, remember, we were, let's turn the clock, seven and a half years back, uh, four guys on a laptop, and we had this idea about uh, bringing technology to the restaurant industry. The restaurant industry, historically, is very, very underserved by technology. And they really, really don't technology so much. And we had this idea to bring point of sale software to the iPad, right? The iPad back then was something very, very new. The iPad was looked at as a toy by the entire market. It was not being marketed as a business to business uh, tool. But we, had, we were quite certain that it would be a great idea to use it in a business to business environment. Um, what you gotta know is that the two most successful solutions in the industry <clears throat> were on the one hand, PC-based solutions. You've all seen these big screens with colorful buttons at the back of the restaurant, right? These screens, they cost more than 4,000 euros. Remember, an iPad is 400 euros. And the other market-dominating solution was nothing. Pen and paper, right? Very, very cheap. And so we had this idea and we brought basic point of sale functionality onto an iPad and we did not reinvent the wheel when it came to point of sale uh, software. There was nothing to be reinvented. Schnitzel, Pommes, Beer. There's, there's not much to it, right? But we, we, got, it, we got to work and uh, our first customer was the P1 uh, nightclub in Munich where the Bayern München stars uh, do what they do, and um, it was interesting from a startup point of view because um, uh, we got the we, we got to agree on this on the fact that we would produce the, the software for them, and we had about four months' time, and uh, we didn't have developers back then, and it was it was a wild ride, but. The first night, the reopening of the PINs in München came and uh, <clears throat> our software did not uh, die until five minutes after the shift was closed, so great success. All right, and then we had a full day to, to prepare the next shift. And we were all over the media and like in hospitality business, ooh, PINs in Munich. They're doing this thing with the iPad, and, and we got into Süddeutsche Zeitung, and uh, we got to, to win several awards for being, you know, innovative. 
and innovators and early adopters, they were jumping all over us. It was, it was a very inbound driven uh, uh, growth phase, right? They were calling us, they were emailing us, and they found us, not we found them. And the kind of com uh, customers that we had, they were great. They were the best customers you could possibly imagine. They were like restaurant owners that used to code and they were really interested in the technology and they wanted to know more and they, they gave us feedback and they sent us emails and videos of ideas on new features and it was, it was epic. And we, they, came, they came coming in and they just said, oh, I want to have it and they didn't ask us questions and they wired the money and woo, we were, we were flying. Like we were super, super successful, and we would we, we would win one award after the other. Financial Times happy, um, and we said uh, if we win the Financial Times award, it was uh, fifty thousand euros. If we win it, we fly the entire company to Portugal to go surfing, and we did win, and we did fly to Portugal, and it was uh, it was epic, um, and they were so forgiving. You know, our, our software was buggy. The, we, we didn't really know how to, to, to do a lot of things, and um, we were growing our sales and marketing team, and uh, you know, bug here, problem there, not so not so big of a problem because the people that were buying from us, they were really okay with compromises, right? Uh, the way we had people that, that that had to restart their app like every two minutes, and they said, oh, "Yeah, not a big deal. I really love the software." And, uh, you guys are cool. You rock, and um, we, we, you know, we 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 rode that wave. We rode that wave. We 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 rode it well. It was, it was good times, and we did solve a problem, right? Like we 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 brought, we brought this this whole uh, point of sale software onto a piece of hardware that was very very easy to operate. It was very cheap, and um, it had a very very good user interface and we, were, we made those people happy and we were getting investment and the, you know, the first Christmas party, champagne, second Christmas party, more champagne and uh, series A came and uh, we were you know rolling out uh, our, our software. And just to, to, to get an idea of the timeline, how long after, after founding your company was this, this, this first peak of I, I'd say the first two years. Yeah. Say the first two years, seed investment, Series A, and uh, wow, uh, it was cool. Then, you know, we 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 were growing. We we made promises to our investors to grow even more. And you, you all know these hockey sticks, uh, hockey stick uh, graphs. And of course, that's the one we showed. And and we said Germany is only the start. There is so much more potential, and we're the biggest, and we're growing faster than anyone else. And and that was all true. And um, remember what I said earlier about saying no. That's not what we did. We said a lot of yes. We said yes to bowling centers, to beer gardens, to discotheques, to restaurants, to cafes. And the kind of people that bought from us, um, they were early adopters. They were OK with compromise, right? And they were, uh, they were happy. And we're starting to grow our sales organization, 10, 15 people. And you know that pond where we're fishing in? It kind of got small for all those, like, because the main people that were interested in our software were innovators and early adopters. And that's only a small fraction of the industry, right? So when the phone kind of kept ringing, but it didn't ring more often just because we got more people, our people tried to reach out to, to, to restaurant owners, right? And those people that didn't call us, they were so different. They, they didn't want to know about our solution. They were not interested at all. And that made us thinking, like, whew, well, what are we going to do, right? We need to grow. I mean, we, we hired all these salespeople, and uh, we did what salespeople do. We started promising things. Right, and uh, we promised, and it kind of worked. And when promising in the same market didn't really help, we took other industries. We sold our software to hairdressers and uh, beauty salons and uh, some other industries because we had to meet the investors' expectations. And we started to struggle. Right, um, 
we started to get more phone calls of angry people that says, guys, you promised me something half a year ago. It's still not there. And we said, what, what, what changed? What, what, what was going on? The other guys didn't care that it didn't come. They were happy opening and closing the wrap every two minutes. It's exaggerated. Uh, we actually had a lot of happy people that didn't have any complications. Um, and, you know, we were leaning forward even more in our uh, Series C investment round about four years into the company. And uh, we, we, the, our solution was to promise even more, right? So we, instead of saying no and focusing, we said yes and we broadened our operation. We started entering Austria and Switzerland. We started entering the UK because we thought that was a good idea because we all spoke English. And um, we had plans to enter Spain, Italy, and France within a couple of months. And as you can probably imagine, that was not the best idea ever. So um, what happens to a human organism when you put him into a lot of stress, into a lot of yes, a lot of partying, a lot of working, then sooner or later you get a heart attack. We didn't get a heart attack, we got a DDoS attack, a denial of service attack from someone. And uh, our customers, uh, back then more than 2,000, um, they were out of business. They couldn't operate their business for more than 24 hours. And uh, we, were, we were caught in this, you know, trying to say yes to everyone in every industry, every country. And we tried to make it okay for most of them. But that was it, right? Most of our customers were not okay anymore with this compromise, with, with their main software to be out of business for more than an entire day. And that forced us to sit down and to re-elaborate what we're going to do. We knew we wouldn't keep up all those promises, all those markets, all those segments. So we did what we should have done a lot earlier. Instead of over-promising and under-delivering, we said, okay, let's analyze our entire customer set and let's analyze where we can beat competition and where we can kick their ass today with what we have without any promises. So we did that. So we, we, uh, we focused onto the DAC region and we focused onto a sub-segment of the market uh, in the hospitality industry and boy, that hurt. We had to start saying no to other countries, other industries, other, uh, other categories and we really started only selling to those people where we really, really knew we could make them really, really happy. And that went on for a year and our sales tanked. Our investors were not amused and we believed in what we were doing and it paid off. After about a year of, of quite some struggles, we really became very, very popular again in this sub-segment of the market, right? And today we sell uh, one of five systems sold in this industry comes from us and our market share is already more than 10%. And from this position of strength, now we attack the next segments. Now we enter other markets. Now we are very, very strong, stable, and we have a very, very high net promoter score. So most of our customers are very, very happy to recommend us. And this is what drives growth now. So what drives growth today is, other, is customers referring other customers and not our salespeople promising promising things that we can't deliver. And we really, really started to say no. And that obviously gave us a hard time for a year. But after that, it really, really paid off. So what I want to uh, give to you as a takeaway is um, in the beginning of your startup, don't think it's your product or business model that works so well. It's the innovators that really want to know about innovation. So 
don't be super proud or super um, optimistic about the company you're building if innovators buy your product, right? They are perfect for testing your product and they're perfect to, to find out what works and what doesn't. But it does not validate your business model. Don't overpromise and underdeliver. Um, if things go bad, don't fix it by going broad. Fix it by going narrow. Um, sync with your investors. Good investors will appreciate if you focus and if you start to say no. And that includes less aggressive growth in the beginning and more aggressive growth in the later years. You better find yourself investors that understand that and appreciate that. And, uh, well, you we had to learn the hard way that you want to invest in cybersecurity. <laughs> All right, so um, that was the, that was the 42 minute summary of, of how, how I think you can disrupt uh, a market and what you have to do and some, some story of our, stories of our company. I thank you and um, please get in touch with me over email or LinkedIn and now I'm very, very happy to take questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering, when you started saying no, what did you change? What did you focus on during that year? Well, um, investment-wise, we invested a lot more in features and products and stability and less in marketing and sales. So we were always a very marketing sales-driven company and we, we, had, to <clears throat> we had to refocus uh, that into being a product-driven uh, or a more product-driven and uh, technology-driven company. So we invested heavily there and invested less heavily in, in marketing sales, which obviously was a hard time for me. <laughs> um, you told about how the mass market people don't really want to make compromises, right? That's right. Um, could you break down probably, probably what you mean by compromise? Is that just like product quality? Because that's kind of what it sounded like, right? But it's probably more than that. Oh, oh no, it's much more than that. Again, uh, it's not, your company is not about your product only. Your company is, for the mass market, is about everything. Pricing, service, sales, marketing, everything. So let's say you have a, a better product than your competition. And you have a great marketing, better than your competition, or the market leader. And uh, you have a similar sales force. But, and you even have a, a similar pricing. But if they can't pay the way they used to pay, it might scare them away. So it's these tiny, tiny differences where the mass market is not okay with compromises. They are okay with spending more. It's, it's not of their concern. Price or features or top notch, it's not of their concern. They look at they, want, they, they want, don't want to make mistakes. They don't want to invest. They don't want, they don't want to take risks, right? So you better have a, a package, right? That's what the, what the book calls a whole product, what I call the whole offering. The pricing has to match the needs and wants. Remember that one. The, the segments, they differentiate themselves over different needs and wants. And for your target segment, you better know these needs and wants, and you better need them. And it's not important what you think is important. Look at the customer's perspective. Look at the market leader. What are they getting from them? What do they like about it? What do they dislike about it? Right? You really want to kick this market leader's ass in all aspects. So not only in the price, but also in the way you pay, not only in the service level quality, but in the different offerings within the service. Not only in a better website, but in, t in, in an entire marketing strategy. Not only in features, but also in usability. Not only, right, it, it, it's the whole thing that needs to be better. The mass market is not okay with compromises. The early adopters are. 
and most likely you're not going to get out of the gates with a perfect package, right? But in that phase, you can learn. In that phase, you can polish. But don't be fooled. The early adopters will buy and be happy with your product, although it is not a whole offering. Right? You really need to go down and talk to your customers. Observe within your custom and prospect base. Learn about your first dozen, hundred, thousand, depending on your business model, um, customers. Because there lies the information, which target market, which niche is the best to, uh, to attack the mass market, right? Any other questions? Please. Did you later find out who would did the DDoS attack against you? No comment. I can't say that. And in which markets are you currently operating? So are you focusing on, still focusing on restaurants? Or? Yes, we are. Yes, we are absolutely f okay. focused. So um, point of sale systems are used across service, retail, hospitality, everywhere, right? And we chose hospitality. And we thought that would be, that's a nice segment. We were wrong. We had to sub-segment that segment into cafes, bars, restaurants, beer gardens, and then be perfect for that one sub-segment of the segment, right? So what we're currently doing is going from a couple of sub-segments into more segments within that market, and we're focusing still on Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, right? So we're, we're, we're really still in focus phase and slowly growing our market base in, in, those, in those segments. But within those segments, we were very, very successful. So there, we are really considered one of the market leaders uh, within these segments. And that's what drives our growth. So a few segments being strong there instead of many segments being weak in all of them. When you focused on a specific um, niche in your market, yes. what were your differentiating points to your competition? So what did you focus on um, to find out that you're the best one? Um, it's a very good question, and, and we did that way too late, basically. So as I explained, we should have done that very uh, much, much earlier. And I, as I said, also, it was not features. It was not the, 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 the software. It was much uh, that we had to find out. We had to go and talk to our customers. What is it that you love about us? And basically, the answer was peace of mind and simplicity. So we changed our communication from explaining how something works, how you click and, and how that looks like, and to one level much more abstract. So our website does not explain anymore how our, our product works. That's for product-oriented people very weird, right? We don't explain how it works. We explain what the end result is. It's peace of mind and simplicity. So that was the, the angle that we took on the market because the market leader and uh, the way they operate, they were very product-centric, right? And they were not thinking in benefits, right? They, they were thinking in, in features and pricing, and, and we stopped that. We stopped comparing ourselves with them, and we played a different game, and that was, that was very successful. All right, then that's a wrap. Thank you, guys.